since 2012, I've been doing interviews with displaced Syrians across the Middle East and um, in Europe. I've interviewed something like 400, maybe more than 400 Syrians at this point. Um, I've collected some of those in, uh, in the book that was mentioned that is something of an oral history of the Syrian revolution. It tries to talk about the origins, the beginning of the uprising, its spread, its militarization, the experience of civilians living war, ultimately the outflow of a refugee um, dispersion, all through a curation of excerpts from these various long, long testimonials that I gathered. And there's a lot more to say about that, but what I'd like to focus on, um, although there are many different themes that run throughout these interviews and throughout the book, one for sure is hope and the ups and the downs of a journey of hope, of hope for hope. So I'd like to share some of those voices from the book and also some beyond the book today with that focus going along with our theme, um, Doomed by Hope. And along the way, we'll hope to try to point out some commonalities I see between Syrian and Palestinian experiences. And my remarks will proceed in four parts. So part one, Syria before 2011, or hope is not allowed. And there is so much to say about the authoritarian regime that was established by Hafez al-Assad in 1970 and then inherited by his son Bashar al-Assad in the year 2000. The stories that I've always liked to focus on have been on the lived experience of authoritarianism. And the stories that I've collected over the years talking about experienced citizens have described how a single ruling political party, an omnipresent security apparatus, state surveillance, pervasive network, covert informants, and a constant threat of violent repression all combine to police society and encourage society to police itself. One sense of what it meant to be a citizen in Assad, Syria was best captured in the expression, hush, the walls have ears. As one man elaborated to me, using a metaphor that I heard many, many times, some of you might use as well, Hafez al-Assad tamed the Syrian people by using security and military rule. It was like when you have a wild animal that you want to make a pet. Syria became a big farm. The stories that I collected showed in this era of hope is not allowed, uh, that violence, it was not only violence or threat of violence, but also corruption and co-optation that sort of served to systematically create obedience for the state. And for citizens, this could be a form of a kind of disposition to silence, constitutive of their own sense of self in being in the world. Here, another voice um, from a young man who's now in Denmark who recalled, the brainwashing process starts when you go to school. We love the leader, we love the regime. Without them, the country will collapse. You grow up with that in the back of your mind. But even as an innocent child, you see that the whole system just reeked. It fed on corruption and grew. If you want to get a passport, you have to bribe this guy and that guy. From when you're little, you're taught that this is the only way to survive in this country. As an active member of the ruling party, you're going to get better grades, better chances for better schools or jobs. Everything is handled by how loyal you are to the regime. So you're raised on the principle that you have to show your loyalty. In pre-2011 Syria, I would say, again, based on the stories that I've collected, that the exception that seemed to prove the rule of this sense of a kind of resignation more than hope was arguably after Bashar came to power in the year 2000, when many believed that this young, educated head of state would make change and he presented itself as a modernizer and a reformer. And I call that chapter about stories under Bashar's first decade in my book, Hope Disappointed, which I think captures the other elements of those first 10 years. So by the time we're on the eve of the, of the revolution, 2010, 2011, Arguably, for most of the people, most of the time, there was a sense that to hope for better politics simply seemed foolish. To take action based on that hope could be reckless. It would probably just get you and maybe also your family in the worst forms of danger. So to cite my colleague Nate Brown, a political scientist, talking about Egypt under Mubarak, the sense that people had was to make change, 
felt like fighting gravity. It was simply impossible. Or as one student told me in his words on the opening to the book, a Syrian citizen is simply a number. Dreaming is not allowed. That's part one. Part two, the revolution, or daring to dream, daring to hope. Of course, there's so much to say about how Syrians began to watch the wave that's called the Arab Spring, following developments in Tunisia and then Egypt and elsewhere, many at the time thinking, it'll never happen in Syria. We've been too intimidated. So when Syrians nonetheless launched protests, what did it mean for those who went out into the streets? I always say that this, for me, is most captured in that ubiquitous expression that the uprising was possible because people broke the barrier of fear. What I think is meant by that expression is not that people cease to be afraid, but in spite of everything, they mustered the courage to hope and to act on that hope. Here, another voice to express what that was like. A mother from Aleppo who said, oppression was residing in us. It was part of our life, like air, sun, water. We didn't even feel it, like air is there. And you never ask, where is the air? <clears throat> but then, in one second, in one shout, in one voice, you blow it up. Don't even imagine that it was easy to go out for demonstrations. No amount of courage allows you to stand there and watch someone who has a gun that is about to kill you. But still, this incredible oppression made us go out. I encouraged my nieces and nephews to come with me to demonstrations. I felt that if they didn't try that experience, they'd be missing the real meaning of life. When you chant, you shudder, and your body rises, and everything you imagined just comes out. Tears come down, tears of joy, because I broke the barrier. I am not afraid. I I'm a free being. Sadness and happiness and fear and courage, they're all mixed together in that voice, and it comes out strong. I would ask people to describe for me their first demonstrations. And what people said most frequently is, that was simply indescribable. You can't put into words what that feeling was like. And I would say, I'm writing a book. I work in words. Can you try to describe it? People would say things like, it was the first time I breathed, the first time I felt like a human, the first time I felt like a Syrian citizen. One man said, it was better than my wedding day. When my wife heard that. She refused to speak to me for a month. Here I quote a Syrian writer, Rima, who many of you might know, who described her first demonstration in these terms. She said, I was in a demonstration. And I started to whisper, freedom. And then I started to hear myself repeating, freedom, freedom, freedom. And then I started shouting, freedom. And I thought, this is the first time I have ever heard my own voice. And I told myself that I would never let anyone steal my voice again. I think what these and so many voices and stories emphasize that breaking through fear was no simple act. It was the discovery and fulfillment, perhaps of a sense of personhood that had been subjugated. That was a sense of hope that fueled the revolution then was not some simple emotion, not the way we often use hope in our everyday lives, many of us today. It was a political victory. It was an act of will. It was sheer courage against all odds. Part three, a cruel war against hope. Today, of course, that euphoria of those heady days of 2011 seemed like an increasingly distant memory. As we know, there were largely peaceful protests for months, the regime responded with various types of violence. The opposition took up arms. 
non-state and state parties became involved in the cracks of this fragmented situation. The regime's reprisals escalated, and this evolved into the full-fledged, multi-sided, brutal war that we see today, or perhaps we see winding down today. I would say that war has taken Syrians' hope and starved it, tortured it, bombed it to shreds. So here I'd like to share three voices from different times and places, each emphasizing a different emotion that many Syrians have felt, at least at one point or another, has taken the place of hope, as hope has become subjugated to unspeakable violence. The first one, 2013, Amman Jordan, hope becoming doubt. I interview an activist turned fighter in a hospital room where his leg has just been amputated. He strokes his stump of a leg and he says, we know that freedom has a price and democracy has a price, but maybe we pay a price that is higher than freedom, that is higher than democracy. There's always a price for freedom, but not this much. Two. 2016, Berlin, hope becoming guilt. I reconnect with a doctor who I interviewed in Jordan three years earlier and has now made it to Germany, where he's learned the language, is now successfully working in a hospital again. In the terms of the refugee crisis, he is a success story, but he warns me that this does not mean that he's well. He says, I left because I was at risk of being arrested. Still, my conscience bothers me. My mind is in turmoil because of the contradiction between the comfort I had here in the heart of Europe and the suffering of people back home. <coughs> Why do people in this world have such little sympathy for people dying in Syria? A Russian plane is able to drop phosphorus bombs on <coughs> some human beings because the world has grown accustomed to their deaths. It's as if the blood that circulates in our veins is of lesser value. 3, 2017, Chicago, hope perhaps becomes regret. It's March 15th, the sixth anniversary of the start of the Syrian uprising. Lina Sergia, who I know was here addressing you all last year, who we all know and have dear to our hearts as a gifted writer and also director of the Charitable Karen Foundation, pens these reflections on Facebook. Many of you perhaps <coughs> read them and remember them when she wrote them in 2017. Talking about the reflections on what she wishes she could go back and tell herself on March 15, 2011. Here in a abbreviated version, Lena wrote, I wish I could go back to that day and tell my younger self everything I know now. I wish I could go back and pull my country away from the edge of the cliff and push it back into the black hole it was before and bury it deep. We witnessed epic and historic moments of courage and sacrifice from men, women, and children, but nothing was worth where we are now. On that day, everyone said, the wall of fear is finally toppled. I wish I could go back to tell everyone. Maybe that wall was destroyed, but it will be replaced with so many other walls of fear that will terrify us for eternity. Most of all, I would tell our younger selves that we should never have never believed in hope or justice. They don't exist for us. I would tell her and all of you, silence your voices. Turn back around. It's not our turn this time. Maybe in another lifetime, but not this time. I'm sorry. Part four, today, or doomed by hope. So I shared these three tremendously depressing uh, voices, all expressing in some way extreme opposites of hope in order to convince you, and many of you have probably already convinced, how utterly heroic it is that Syrians are still able to maintain any hope at all, because they do. As many tell me until now, it's impossible to live without hope. 
So it seems to me that every Syrian who remains alive has hope. Those who are under siege, those who are injured, those who are in prison and the families who wait for them, all have hope. They need to in order to live. And this is an act of will and personal strength that I think is worthy of respect and admiration. The current stage of war and displacement, then, is not the termination of Syrians' journeys of hope. As space is wisely quoting Sa'adala al Wanunis, what happens today cannot be the end of history. So how, then, are Syrians looking to the future? So I just spent three months interviewing uh, in Germany and Turkey and Lebanon, and I haven't had a chance yet to transcribe those, those interviews or really even make sense of what I've listened. So I won't, unfortunately won't be able to present a few full view of what I've just gathered. But here are some general themes that I think came through in this most recent interviewing trip of mine. Um, things I've heard about how Syrians are keeping hope alive today. A few points. One, extracting wisdom from loss. So just a month or so ago, at a park in Gaziantep, Turkey, a 30-something from Aleppo shows me a Facebook post from a teenager he knows who has lost most of his family and is now living displaced in Idlib province. And the teenager posted a message to Syrians in 2018 from a poem that Mahmoud Darwish wrote in the final years of his life, in which he wrote, do not regret a war that has matured you. This, I think, is one aspect of the hope that I believe that I'm seeing among Syrians today, a mature hope, a hope that carries a wisdom that has aged people well beyond their years, a hope that carries the weighty responsibility to those who have been lost, but is not so weighed down that it cannot still travel forward. Two, designing new strategies. What struck me most in the conversations I had this past summer were how many people were speaking about the revolution as a long-term struggle. As we know, the regime is reconquering territory, reconsolidating power, perhaps even increasingly, as Anna mentioned, being accepted back into the uh, international community as a seemingly legitimate player. But the issues that mobilized people in 2011 have not been resolved. If anything, have been exacerbated. As Palestinian history teaches us, sooner or later, people will rise up again. And I think that many people from Syria are now asking themselves, what do we do now to best support that effort for that eventual, perhaps, rising up again? Here, words of an engineer who I, again, re-met in Istanbul after meeting him several years ago, some shortened words that he laid out in a very systematic way that perhaps as engineers do. He said, so, what should Syrians do now? First, we need to think. Second, each of us needs to achieve some measure of personal stability. Third, we need to document everything we can, because someday the criminals will be judged in courts and we need proof. And also, we need this for future generations, so the regime doesn't impose its narrative to history. And fourth, we need to preserve our identity. Syrians are now dispersed all over the world. If we lose our identities as Syrians, then we've lost everything. That last point connects to another one I'll make. Another idea of keeping hope alive is that making exile a place of creation, not negation. Syrians, like Palestinians, are now facing the reality of shetet. How do we understand the challenge of those on the inside? Does the idea of sumum from the Palestinian experience offer some sense of the role for Syrians who remain inside Syria? What's the role for those now scattered across the globe? Here, words that I recorded from a Palestinian Syrian poet, now in Berlin, who said, I didn't come here to stop. I came here to continue. And that transforms the concept of exile to a starting point for creativity. In Arabic, exile comes from the verb to not exist. But what we're doing here in exile is totally the opposite. We are existing. And I think space is another example of that idea, too. So fourth and finally here, about how to sustain hope, is figuring out a way, of course, to make hope sustainable. 
So to come full circle, to connect the future, to the present, to the revolution, to the authoritarian past, I'll share words that are recorded from a psychologist uh, from the Damascus suburbs who I interviewed almost seven years ago, six and a half years ago, reflecting on what, what that time was still what he called this very new culture of freedom taking root among Syrians. And he said, the person who lives for a long time in an atmosphere of repression does not notice that he's living without hope. But now, he will not enjoy his life if he is not free. <coughs> it's like when someone travels to a new place and realizes that he wasn't happy before. And I think that this is the most important way that Syrians might be doomed by hope. Maybe once you have experienced hope, it's hard to go back to living as if hope was unimaginable. Perhaps you become doomed by hope, doomed to keep trying to keep hope alive. As an activist told me in August in Turkey, we lost a lot, but we also gained. We demanded our rights. We became a people. The most important thing for us at this stage is to protect that last bit of hope that we have left. 